Hello. Uh, we're now working on Chapter 8 on System Initialization in X Windows. Um, there's um, this is a short chapter. The book does a fine job with it, and um, hopefully we can keep things a little short here. But we'll see. This is also a section of the video that is a little bit problematic for me with the technology I'm using because. Um, I can't really reboot systems. I can't switch from one system to another very well. Uh, I can't show you the BIOS um, because everything I'm doing is dependent on me having X Windows up and running. And um, um, I guess I should be using a camcorder right now, but uh, don't have one yet, so that will be fine. Okay. Getting started here, though, with the boot initialization, the first thing one needs to do is to set your BIOS. When you have a dead machine and you um, first start to boot the machine, um, usually there's a little um, bit of text information down in the lower left-hand corner or something like that that says boot escape to get into BIOS or boot F12 or boot F2 to get to your boot menu, something like that. Um, if you go into your BIOS, this is actually um, software that is resident in the um, 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 ROM chips on your motherboard that um, gets executed before the system boots. This is before the system touched the hard drive, before the system knows anything about the operating system. This is intrinsic to your machine. And unfortunately, the BIOSes vary quite a bit machine to machine. Um, um, and uh, so I can't describe them very well. But they will give you a menu system, typically, that you can boot up into. And um, you can choose. What you, where you want to go to boot. Um, yeah, normally, the first place you go to boot is either your CD-ROM or, or DVD-ROM nowadays, or your first hard drive. But uh, the BIOS will often let you vary that. So you could boot off of a USB drive or off of a, um, um, well, a, a thumb drive, uh, off of the network if you want. Um, OK. Once you have that set, then the system starts to boot. And once it boots, what it does is it hits, let's say it's hitting your hard drive, because you told it, boot off the hard drive. It will go down onto the hard drive. It gets the first um, 512K, uh, 512 bytes off of the, um, it's kind of the first sector on the beginning of the hard drive. That's called your MBR, Master Boot Record. And that basically gives the um, system information about the partition table you're using, where to go to get other information on how to boot the system. And, um, and that begins the real boot process that boots your operating system. Uh, sometimes it gives you a menu that lets you choose the operating system you want to boot. Um, OK, there are various pieces of software one can use for your bootloader. Um, one of these in the old days was called Lilo. Well, old days. Lilo is a good piece, a good bootloader. I'm not sure how much it's used anymore. I used it for a long, long, long time. And uh, even after new, newer bootloaders came out, I continued to use Lilo because I liked it. Um, today, it's pretty much re been replaced in the Linux world and uh, maybe some of the other free operating systems by Grub. And today we use um, most of us use the Grub bootloader. Lilo is still around; it works very well. But the default bootloader on most um, Linux operating systems is Grub, and Grub can boot a lot of different operating systems. It can boot, boot um, any distro of Linux I know of. Uh, I think Grub is the bootloader we use for a lot of the BSDs. Grub doesn't exactly boot Windows, but Grub can link to another bootloader. So Grub is often used to boot Windows in that um, there will be a line in Grub that says, link to the um, 
Windows bootloader and then use that to boot. Um, so Grub can be, in effect, used to boot Windows. Um, that makes it very a good bootloader to use if you want a dual boot system where, you know, type 1, boot Linux, type 2, boot uh, FreeBSD, boot type 3, boot um, wi um, Windows 7. Um, the, one of the problems with Grub is the way Grub works is Grub basically has a little bit of information on the MBR <coughs> and then most of the information on Grub is actually in a directory called slash boot slash Grub, uh, which the book describes. And that has a lot of, a number of files in it. And uh, let's take a look at what's over in there. Let's, let's go over here. Let's uh, clear clear this. I happen to be uh, root here, and I want to be root because I um, 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 because that, uh, that way I will have access to the directory. So slash, bro, slash boot slash grub. And there we are. Now, one of the cool things about grub is there is a file down here called, and we'll go into it with VI or Emacs if you prefer, called a menu a dot list. And that file has, well, it's hard to read here, but, um, but that file has a lot of information about how to boot the system. What it means is that you can, uh, if you modify this file, you can actually modify um, the way the system boots. And you can do that without actually changing the MBR. Because the MBR says, go read this file, in essence. And um, now the drawback to that is the way Grub is built, Grub has to be on a Linux file system. Grub will not work on a, um, um, a DOS file system or an NTFS file system. That's a pain. That makes it very hard to build a system where your first disk is a Windows disk exclusively and your second disk is a Linux disk exclusively. Because if you want to use Grub to boot that, um, they, um, um, the, the slash boot slash Grub has to reside on the second disk because that's the only Windows, uh, only Linux disk you have around. That works just fine in most cases. However, if that drive happens to be a removable hard drive, like a USB drive, then what happens is when you remove that drive off the system, you can't even boot Windows because the bootloader looks for that um, for the files in the Grub directory, subdirectory, in the slash boot sub slash Grub directory, and you can't boot. You're really up a crick. Um, so that's sort of a problem. One solution to that is use Gparted or something. Make a little tiny, teeny weeny um, part Linux partition on your um, um, on the hard drive that doesn't get removed, on the number one hard drive. Um, and that, wor that will work just fine, but it does mean using Gparted or whatnot and, and fiddling with that drive, which probably you were probably doing this because you didn't want to fiddle with that drive. Um, there are other ways of doing that, which I will go into later in um, the talk. Um, there, uh, there is another way, though, uh, going back here. There is another bootloader, which is just a variation of Grub called Grub for DOS. I've never used it, but I'm told that Grub for DOS will, um, um, will take care of that problem, that you can then install Grub on an NTFS or a DOS type file system. Other bootloaders that exist. Um, is the Windows bootloaders. I'm not quite sure how many of those there are nowadays. I always thought of it as NDLDR. I guess that's only for the NT technology. Anyway, there are Windows bootloaders. Um, there's also another small family of bootloaders called Sys, 
Linux. Um, and that's actually a family of bootloaders. The best known of these is ISO Linux. And then there's a variation of that called PXE Linux. And what these bootloaders are is they're very specialized bootloaders. They only boot Linux. They're small bootloaders. But they're meant to boot Linux from in various situations. Like ISO Linux boots Linux if you happen to be on a um, uh, from a DVD. So if you're building a distribution and uh, the install DVD, that's a good place to use ISO Linux as opposed to Grub. Um, another place uh, um, it's used widely is for live Linux distributions. Uh, if you go in and look at your Nopic CD, you'll notice that the bootloader it uses is ISO Linux. It does not use Grub. Um, um, I think it's easier to install. I, I don't know. The last time I tried to build a distribution and put it on a CD, at that time, um, building bootloaders for CDs was painful. It's gotten much, much easier, so I won't go into the details. Um, PEX Linux is basically a bootloader to boot your system over a, um, over a network so that you don't need a hard drive or whatnot. Um, uh, the book talks about grub features. Um, I've just talked about dual booting. And, um, a lot of people like to build dual booted systems. Um, I was going to say I don't like to build them myself much. Usually my computers are either DOS or e either Windows or Typically, they're a Unix variation. They're Linux or, or FreeBSD, and, and there's no Windows on them, uh, except maybe a virtual machine in Windows. But, um, but I'm, I have two computers sitting in front of me at the moment, and both of them will boot Windows. Uh, the one I boot in Windows the other all the time. The other one, I, I assume it will boot Windows. I haven't booted it. In, well, actually, I haven't, I haven't rebooted it in couple months now, and um, uh, it's been running Linux. Uh, that's not true. I have rebooted it, but it always boots into Linux, so I don't know. Um, but some people find it very convenient to have dual boot systems. And um, what happens if you have a boot, dual boot system or a, boot, a system and you, you foul up your MBR? Because then you can't boot your system. Well, there's a couple things we should talk about here. The first one is you can use the DD command to back up your MBR and keep a backup of your MBR someplace. If you go with a command like DD space, um, oh, I may have to look this up. Um, I think I have to look this up. But if you Google for this, you'll find it right away um, for backing up an MBR. It's the DD command, go, go back, whoop, back up MBR DD. And um, something like this probably does it. Um, That looks like a command that will do it. That will copy your MBR into a hard drive um, it, it, where your initial disk was HDX. More likely, your initial disk, your number one disk, is probably slash DEV slash SDA. And this command here, that will back it up. Um, OK. Now, I have one last topic to discuss here. And um, that is um, fixing up your MBR if it really gets damaged. Um, the thing that I would, let me check one thing here. OK. The thing I would do to back up my MBR, if, or to fix my, oh, sorry, I'm out of time. I'll have to start up on another part.